It is always a woman. No, I said that uh, central figures in the trans movement are nonces, and I'm afraid again, it's true. I'm very, very, very angry. I'm so angry. I, I, I sometimes think this, this, this thing can't make me any angrier, and then it makes me angry. It's, it's an extraordinary thing, the capacity this has to make me angry. Um, what about comparing people in the trans debate to speaking out against Nazis? I mean, that's pretty extreme. Well, there's a couple of parallels. One is that uh, at the moment, um, children are uh, basically being experimented on with uh, uh, puberty blockers. Uh, for instance... Oh, you're... come on, you're not serious. For over 2,000 years, human beings have used writing to communicate complex ideas across vast stretches of space and time. Permanent records of some of the most important ideas ever conceived of by humankind and the annals of our histories both are kept safe and practically immortal by the written word. Since the invention of the printing press, the knowledge contained within these sacred tomes can be transmitted far and wide, and everyone from tenement farmers to kings can access the vastness of human knowledge with either the flick of a page or the push of a button. The internet has brought unlimited information to the entire world. But until now, reading has only ever been used for gaining knowledge. Never before has writing truly developed the power to destroy the reader, to rot their brain from the inside out. In 2023, that all changed. Graham Linehan, ex-wife guy and current carbonara man, set out in the twilight of his career and the edges of his sanity to write the first book in history that would actively make the reader less intelligent with every word. Into this book, he poured his hatred for trans people, his divorceness, his frustration with having never beaten the sacred game of Beaver Bother, and of course, his rage at being cancelled. So cancelled that this book would be serialised in two major newspapers. Famous celebrities would endorse it and give pull quotes, and reviews would go up all over the British and Irish press. In the land of Norwich, in the fires of Glenna's bachelor pad, Graham Linehan wrote in public this master book, to undermine the prestige of all others, to putrefy the very medium of literature from the inside, and into this book he poured all of his cruelty, his malice, and his will to banish all trans people from the face of the earth. One by one, the free colonists of England fell to the power of the transphobic screed, but there were some who resisted. One colonist remained, and she marched all the way over to her local waterstones on the very slopes of Nottingham and... <coughs> <coughs> I, uh... I read Graham Linehan's terrible book. Just look at this bastard. <laughs> That's right. That's right, we're having lunch. Come on in. Look at him. Look. What do they want from me? Why can't they just leave me alone? Yes, that's right. Much that once was is lost, but none now live to remember it. It began with me, Bridget Empire, science and culture correspondent for the Daily Telegraph. The only newspaper in Britain that didn't receive an advanced reading copy of Tough Crowd by Graham Lenahan. Quite possibly the most confusing book ever written. But don't worry, dear viewers, because I take this job seriously. So, I went out and got Graham Linehan's horrible book myself, and I've regretted it ever since. Seriously, I read this book for this channel so I could make this video as soon as it came out. And only now, months later, have I recovered from this experience enough to report what I found. In short, Tough Crowd offers the answer to one of the great questions of human existence. What if a book was just a long tweet. But why would I put myself through this torture you might ask? Well, because once upon a time, and at this point in my YouTube career, this shouldn't come as a shock to you because my track record on idolizing the worst people on earth in my early teens is honestly one of the ones of the world. Once upon a time, I was a Graham Linehan fan. A Graham Linehan fan, if you will, and I will. Because at this point, if I don't laugh at myself, I'll cry so hard I'll shoot blood from my eyeballs like a desert-dwelling lizard. The story goes something like this. A long, long time ago, when I was but a young writer, long before I began and ended a career in paleontology, long even before I began my years-long transformation to this big titty queen you see before you, 
I had an idol. Once upon a time, that idol was one jowling, cowling, rowling. And though the Harry Potter books had long since stopped coming, she was still up there. At this point, though, although I decided I wanted to be a writer already, I was getting interested in comedy, maybe. And it just so happened that at this time, one of the greatest living comedy writers, in my mind, was just about starting to get his time in the sun. After writing Father Ted, he was involved with Black Books, which is, to this day, one of my favourite TV shows of all time. Little did I know at the time that he had barely anything to do with that at all, and that Dylan Moran, the actual man behind the curtain of the show, had kicked him off the show early, and in the following years, distanced himself from this man. Despite this, after a few years of writing The IT Crowd, a funny, if pretty sexist TV show, he started appearing on the British panel show circuit, showing up on TV for interviews, and becoming well-known as a name outside of his work, as well as for the work he'd done. My comedy writing hero at the time was one Graham Linehan. I am, in retrospect, a terrible judge of character. And you can tell I mean that, because I'm sitting here in a Union Jack dress. Yes, that's right. If my track record is anything to go by, keep an eye on every person I've ever idolised, because they're sure to be some sort of horrible bigot. So sorry in advance to Stephen King, Brandon Sanderson, George R. R. Martin, Robin Hobb, and the boatload of other people that are sure to be cancelled by the woke trans lobby, as Graham Linehan and Rowling would call it, if my instincts are anything to go by. In fact, f for a few of those, I can already think of some yikes things they've said and done, so let's just avoid that potential minefield for now. For those of you blessed enough to not know who Graham Linehan is, Graham Linehan is a former comedy writer from Dublin, Ireland, who was, in a previous life, known as the creator and writer of Father Ted and the IT Crowd, and is also known for Black Books, even though he was fired as the director pretty early on, and apparently Dylan Moran, the real star of Black Books, hated working with him. So basically, he is Black Books stolen valor. But he was all over Father Ted and the IT Crowd, shows that had huge cultural impacts, made several household names out of previously relatively unknown actors, and did both generally, well, at least in the case of Father Ted, God and his classics of the genre. The IT Crowd has aged a little badly in some respects, but nowhere near as badly as most comedies in the mid-2000s, so it gets a pass. Graham Linehan would, much like J.K. Rowling, go from being a well-liked and popular writer, considered very liberal and safe, to being the face of wanting trans people to fuck off into the sun, despite them never having done anything to him, except suggests that one episode of the IT Crowd might be a bit transphobic. Because it was a bit. I used to be a man, Douglas. <laughs> I used to be a man. Oh, I wish there was an easier way of saying that, but believe me, there's not. <laughs> I've had a lot of hormone therapy and a number of operations. I'm really sorry. I, I hope you don't feel I deceived you. I understand if, if you would rather I left. I don't care. <laughs> Again. It was less transphobic than a lot of other TV shows at the time, like How I Met Your Mother, for example, but it wasn't ideal. Remember when I had a penis? <laughs> that mild criticism, however, was enough to turn Graham Linehan from a nice, if bit creepy writer of beloved sitcoms into a man who spends day and night harassing trans people and anyone who dares to not hate them as much as he does, comparing them to Nazis and the Stasi, and accusing them of grooming children of orchestrating campaigns of mass sterilization, and a load of other bollocks which he basically invents on the fly to justify his burning hatred. When really, and we will get to this because he basically spells it all out in his book, his hatred is all about his ego. Trans people didn't like something he wrote, and he took that personally. Subsequently, he made his entire life, his entire personality, everything he cared about, a campaign to force all trans people out of the public eye, if not something worse. But he did write Father Ted, and that was pretty good, I guess. So, swings and roundabouts, really. These days, Graham Linehan can be found attending anti-trans protests, screaming at people on Twitter after Elon Musk unbanned him from that hell site, and performing what might generously be called stand-up comedy to five people outside the Scottish Parliament, because normal venues won't host him. Those five people not exactly laughing super hard at his material either. In fact, here's a clip of his incredible comedy set now. The doctor came in and he said, uh, I got good news and I got bad news. I said, uh, oh, I'll have the good news first because I'm unlike, unlike everyone else, I like to hear the good news first because I feel like it protects you against, the, uh, against whatever the bad news has to throw at you. So I said, what's the good news? He said, you have cancer of the testicles. 
I said, okay, what's the bad news? He said, that's as good as it's going to get for five years. <laughs> Don't go, ah. Oh. So yes, once upon a time, I was a great admirer of former Irish comedy writer and current most divorced man in Norwich, Graham Linehan. This was all, of course, long before I preempted my YouTube career by publishing a terribly sung parody song about him alongside a montage of a bunch of his most misogynistic tweets. And even before Graham Linehan spent his Saturdays fingering a spaghetti carbonara fresh out of the microwave in between making new and libelous claims about people on Twitter, like that time he called David Tennant a child groomer for wearing a pride pin in his lapel, or even before Graham Linehan invented a cool and normal social network exclusively for people who think trans people should die. Now, you might think, a social network for trans folks? Isn't that called Twitter? But no, you fool! This was back when he was banned from Twitter for repeated cases of harassment, so of course, the only logical next step after that was to create his own social network called Glinda. This, the, the, this isn't a, a joke. He, he really did this. It's still online, and yet somehow it's less users than even the Jeremy Renner app. Not even Graham's posted on Glinda since 2022. Glinda aside, however, my poor judgement led me to following Graham Linehan quite closely, from his principled, if a little creepy, stance during Gamergate, to getting called out for his one pretty transphobic episode of the IT crowd, to going completely off the rails to the point where he wrote a book called Tough Crowd, about how everyone hates him, even though he did absolutely nothing wrong, even though he repeatedly harassed tons of people, got cautioned by the police for that even, and in this very book, which is, of course, the subject of this video, he makes tons of libelous claims about both trans and cis people, and complains that everyone keeps calling him a fascist just because he keeps saying fascist things, including, in this very book, regretting openly not making common cause with the Nazi pug guy, Count Dankula, personally thanking Nazi collaborator Kelly J. Keane, calling her a constant inspiration. And even outside this book, he's appeared on radio shows and podcasts with various heroes of the British right, including a lovely interview with GBBs, while at the same time, he is incandescent that Pink News, along with other sources, claim he'd compare trans people to Nazis, Something he denies in the very same book, that he literally compares trans people to Nazis multiple times. Nazis go around in black telling people what to do, and so did trans activists. They broke up political meetings, used violence and intimidation to achieve their aims, and, most strikingly familiar of all, they supported experiments on gay, autistic, and gender non-conforming children. Later on, he goes even further. Like National Socialism, Gender ideology is a movement that attracts the worst of people. Time and again, central figures in the trans rights movement are revealed as grifters, thugs, paedophiles or perverts. A loose conglomeration of the kind of people who in the past would have been drawn to a career in strike breaking, from the crazed mothers of trans kids to flat out con men using a trans identity to escape pesky creditors. This, was the, this is the guy who admitted he hid his car. <laughs> he hid his car from Bayless. It's like the first, <laughs> the first thing he said in the interview I watched. He's people escaping creditors. That section ends with a claim that 6,500 sexual attacks had occurred in UK hospitals within three years. A figure he, with no evidence, attributes entirely to trans people. This man is dangerous. And almost every word in this book makes my blood run cold. It's kind of like Mein Kampf if Hitler spent half the book complaining that no one liked his paintings anymore. And it gets worse. There's libel in here, or at least defamation, of some people you might be fans of. And for the most part, the people he slandered in this book aren't even trans. They're cis. Just cis people who aren't baying for the blood of trans people. Beyond that, it's just a, a lot. Beyond the libel, Graham's descent into fascism is pretty evident in here. By accident on his part, as he describes himself lecturing his dad on social issues such as gay marriage before becoming more conservative than his dad ever was, and calling out the left for totalitarian thought crime bollocks while snuggling up to people who wouldn't be out of place at a beer hall putsch. Some of you might know that Graham Linehan used to be considered a pretty left-wing guy. 
In fact, he claims in this book that J.K. Rowling has socialist principles as a point in her favour, which she doesn't. She was vehemently anti-Corbyn and personal friends with Gordon Brown, so at best she's a Blairite. He also, in this book, quotes Marxist scholar Mark Fisher, though mostly to imply that trans people drove him to suicide, with zero evidence. Which seems at the very least disrespectful, if not incredibly offensive to both Fisher's family and to the trans community. Like, imagine someone you love dying, and having a man with a face like a ham that someone put a toupee on, trying to use his death as an excuse to attack and demonise a group of marginalised people. In one of the least coherent parts of the book, he cites Naomi Klein's The Shock Doctrine, one of the most influential books of the modern left, to compare trans people trying to gain acceptance to the way that fascist dictatorships in South America used times of national crisis to push forward neoliberal shock treatment economics to devastate countries they were terrorising, as if trying to get people to respect your pronouns is the same thing as pushing millions into poverty. A very telling comparison, if not one that makes much sense if you, you know, live in reality. He also attended the Conservative Party conference in 2023, which is not a thing most people who consider themselves left-wing would be happy to do, proudly calling himself the most cancelled person in this room. I say all this to put this out there now. This book is a memoir of one man's descent into madness. It's like reading a Lovecraft short story, except it's somehow more racist. As much as I would like to tell you that I've condensed everything you need to know about this word salad of a book into this video, well, frankly this book is an absolute mess. It only has structure in so much as it gets the memoir bits out the way early on before devolving into the ravings of a man possessed by the ghost of Heinrich Himmler. In this video, I'm trying to address some of the most striking parts of this book, but if I were to cover everything controversial or potentially legally actionable, this video would be well over 12 hours long. And so, before we get into some of the more murky details, I thought I would address the fact that I'm not exactly going to be charitable to Graham here. Frankly, he doesn't deserve it, so I'm going to quote the man himself at length and let him incriminate himself. I'm not going to try and put a positive spin on his words, because he's made it clear, time and time again, that he means them in the most spiteful, bad faith way. And yes, I will be comparing him to various joints of cured meat throughout this video. Not because I don't think the same couldn't be applied to me, I know that I look like someone put breast implants on an uncooked chicken fillet, but if he feels fit to call me a sex criminal just for electing to become a hot girl as of some kind of dollar store Jack Black, I think I deserve to do a little bit of light ribbing back. And God knows there's not going to be much catharsis coming out of the pages of this cursed book, so frankly, we need to get our wins where we can. I did mention the libel in this book earlier, and some of you might expect that given the stuff Graham Linehan has previously said about David Tennant, everyone from Mermaids, Josie Long, Mona L. Hathaway, and others, but I honestly don't know how this book got past a reading by its publisher's lawyers. Particularly because in this book, Graham, still apparently reeling from being unable to beat Beaver Bother, accuses legendary YouTuber H Bomber Guy of helping to fund the mass sterilization of a generation of gay youth. Harry, if you're watching this, hi, big fan, and uh, I think you should lawyer up, because that's one of the most libelous claims I've ever seen in print. And I make fun of the British press for a living. In fact, Graham explicitly states that he's in a legal battle at this moment with queer actor David Paisley, so maybe you two should coordinate your efforts and this man can have a court-mandated order to shut the fuck up and keep trans people out of his fucking mouth. Besides David Paisley, H Bomber Guy, and David Tennant, Graham famously implied H from Steps as a rapist and a child molester because he blocked transphobes and also happened to share a name with a disgraced former singer from Lost Prophets. Very cool and normal, definitely the behaviour of someone who doesn't have a problem. Just in case you thought that Graham's spurious claims about various public figures, or sometimes private figures, was limited to people that he has personal beefs with online, like H Bomber Guy, well, they're not. While he steers clear from calling David Tennant a paedophile in this book as he has online, and doesn't explicitly print that he thinks trans people are nonces, as he has said on air in various interviews, as well as on his Twitter, he uses this book, which, remember, is supposed to be a memoir, to attack various people who have nothing to do with him and never have. There are a couple of convicted criminals he brings up, as if one person having done a crime makes an entire community of people guilty by association, and in fact it goes on about these cases at length, as if they support his argument that all trans people are just desperate to man the gas chambers. In fact, what there being a few trans people who are objectively bad people proves just that trans people are heartbreakingly normal. There are dickheads in every community. For every person who does harm to others, there are thousands of others who do not. And just as I don't go around saying that all cis people harass women just because Graham Linehan does, I don't think these ravings make the point Graham thinks they do. 
outside of these cases, there are plenty of people, such as H Bomber Guy, that Graham goes after that haven't done anything wrong. Parker Molloy, for example, is called out by name basically just for shit talking Graham Lanahan, as if Graham hasn't done worse to every single trans person on the internet, including Molloy, and even nobody's like myself. And then there's chapter 18 of Tough Crowd called The Resistance, for maximum cringe, in which Graham implies that Susie Green, the CEO of Mermaids, plotted to turn her child trans, and frames her going with her child to get surgery when she was old enough to consent, as a story that should have been met with gasps of horror, rather than, you know, the story of a parent supporting their child. He implies the TED talk where she told the story, being deleted off the internet in 2023, implies some sort of personal guilt on her part. Some evidence that she was being a nefarious witch and had finally been caught, rather than what most likely happened, being that Graham and the other 20 people who spend every waking moment of their lives screaming at anyone who dares to think trans people deserve dignity and love, drove enough harassment their way that the safest option was to just take it down. In fact, if Graham is looking for the cause of Susie Green or other pro-trans adults' content being suddenly deleted of that explanation, he might want to consider that in his, I must continue to remind myself, memoir, he takes time away from talking about how he cast beloved sitcom The IT Crowd to imply Susie Green specifically is a child mutilator, or that H Bomber Guy is performing genocide via eugenics on an entire generation of gay men. All that, as he gets into the following paragraph, Helen Webberly, one of the few GPs in the UK trans people like me could turn to for help when I was stuck waiting sometimes for over a decade for basic medical care, is guilty of medical malpractice. Where the real problem with that situation in particular is that an entire country's worth of trans people is desperate for any help at all, and that they have nowhere to turn to. So one person who is more freely available than the fucking decades-long way to the gender clinic ends up doing a lot of the heavy lifting for thousands of people. That's not the fault of that one person or the trans community. And in fact, a lot of the reason trans healthcare is getting worse, much worse, and not better in the UK, is because of the protests and lies of people like, why, the very author of this book, who compared puberty blockers to the eugenics experiments performed on minorities during the Holocaust, for example or promoted wild conspiracy theories about the long-term effects of puberty blockers and cross-sex hormones on human bodies when their effects are pretty well fucking known if you're not a crank and know how to read. But you know, trans people might have had their lives made materially worse by Graham and his friends' his constant campaigning. Sorry, not friends. Most of the movement have distanced themselves from him at this point. But it's not like Graham hasn't had bad stuff happen to him. He's been very open, for example, that the trans movement took his family from him. They took everything from me, you know. Like what? What do you mean? They took my, fa my family, you know. I, all I was doing was, you know, writing comedy and playing board, board games and, and, set, and being silly on the internet. And then I just said, no, hang on a sec. Stop calling these women turfs. Stop sending them abuse. Let them speak. And for that... They, they just destroyed me. Do you honestly feel destroyed? No, because because the one thing about this, the one thing about this that keeps me going is that I know I'm right, you know? I know I'm right. By which, of course, he should clarify that. I'm sure he would. Trans people didn't take his family away from him. He, in fact, drove his family away himself by spending every waking moment of his life. And I mean every waking moment. Because if you check his Twitter records, he tweets just about every 20 minutes at all hours of the day or night sometimes, frothing at the mouth about trans people. The wife and daughter he's so adamant he's trying to shove us back in the closets to protect were driven away by this very behaviour. In fact, he's so oblivious to this that you can quite easily find footage of him ignoring his son trying to give him a present on his birthday so that he can continue his YouTube series where he cries, screams and throws up about how terrible trans people are. My son chooses now to give me my present. Well, that's of you neglecting his family and saying anything on the spectrum from inappropriate to defamatory things about other people, however, his memoir, which is a word that is slowly losing its meaning the more I reread this book, contains one very sincere apology. Is it to trans people who he has harassed in their hundreds and campaigned for years to worsen the lives of? No, of course not. Is it to the many women he admits to having hurt at the height of his career in this very book? Well, 
kind of, and that he says he hates himself for hurting them. But if he was really sorry, he might think about being open in what exactly he did and who he hurt and actually start making amends for those women rather than spending all this energy hurting a whole different group of people. And of course, all the women that happen to be standing in the way of his berserker rage against trans people. But no, no. The one clear apology he gives in this book with his victim named and his crimes detailed is to one Count Dankula. Yes, that's right. The one person Graham feels sorry for hurting enough to make a detailed apology to, after everything he's done, is the Nazi pug guy. The fascist associate of Tommy Robinson. The former candidate for UKIP. Choices. <laughs> See, Kyle? Um, I apologise unreservedly for my part in what happened to you now. Um, I don't really have much of an excuse, except that since I kind of came out of it, I realised that I was in a, uh, as someone else put it recently, a silo um, where I'd worked myself into a lather thinking that uh, Nazis were, were, were in, the, um, in the woodwork. Uh, of course, it turns out that the real authoritarians are uh, left-wing uh, misogynistic men. This heartfelt apology to one of the internet's most unserious fascists, which, you know, it's a low bar, but someone has to limbo under it, comes after Graham describes his involvement in Gamergate, in which he, in retrospect, is appalled that he was on the side of people calling Nazis Nazis, because now he's one of those people that gets called a Nazi, just for pushing fascist talking points and writing a manifesto about how all trans people are part of an evil conspiracy to destroy a generation of children. Honestly, it's not a surprise to me that he ended up at this point, but it does tickle my brain a little to see him decry people calling him and others fascists, and using this to segue into apologising to a literal fascist for calling him a fascist, when he spent several pages in this book explicitly comparing trans people to the Nazis in multiple different ways, with much more spurious evidence than he had to paint Count Dankula as a fascist with, who, I must remind you, is the Nazi pug guy. Well, at least someone will be sleeping soundly tonight. Good night, Count Dankula. Have a lovely one. Good thing Graham cleared the air there, really. If only there was someone else, maybe a ton of people, who he'd actually wrongly accused of being fascist, that he might want to think about apologising to. No. No, it's not coming to me right now, I'm sorry. Graham, remind me, why did you have to apologise to the Nazi pug guy? Another narrative to which I had unconsciously signed up was that the right were evil and that they were using dog whistles to advance their cause, injecting anti-Semitism, racism and other isms back into the discourse in the form of comedy. It was in this fertile and febrile atmosphere that I heard about Count Dankula, who had filmed a video of his girlfriend's dog which he had trained to give a small Nazi salute every time he said phrases like gas the Jews and Sieg Heil. In my evidence gathering, I relied on the same sources that would later come after me. Many times Count Dankula attempted to reach out to me, but it was to no avail. I had made my mind up. Count Dankula was a fascist using comedy to advance his fascist aims. To my eternal shame, I even tried to hobble a crowdfunder that he had started to raise money for his defence. The story I had told myself was more powerful even than the hundreds of messages I was receiving telling me that I had got this one terribly wrong. From the outset, the same activists were using cancellation, protests and shaming to achieve their aims. Unlike me, some quickly recognised the left's lurch to authoritarianism. As funny as it is that Graham takes time out of his hundreds of pages of painting trans people as inherently evil untermention to apologise for one of the few things he was right about in his time as an internet celebrity, however, it's still hard to read this and square it with the fact that the person who wrote all that wrote Father Ted in the IT crowd, two of the most highly regarded sitcoms of the modern era. Much like J.K. Rowling, you can look at this interaction from afar and just know, implicitly, that he didn't have to do this. Like rolling after him, he could have just stayed quiet and enjoyed the fame and money from his work. Even produced that Father Ted musical, he spends the last few chapters of the book crying that his transphobia prevented him from being able to see through to the end.
could have left this all alone. Even the good parts, even him being part of the backlash to Gamergate could have passed him by. He didn't need to be in that fight, but at least it wasn't something to look back on with shame. And yet, it seems to be the one regret he has in regards to how he used his public persona. His worst sin as a celebrity, in his eyes, was fighting against nascent fascism. And you know, that almost sounds like something, I don't know, someone who sympathizes with fascism might think. Don't worry though, because he might be doubling down on some of the worst things he's ever done and peddling back on some of the good things he did, with some infrequent alluding to the actual work of writing sitcoms thrown in there to break up the vitriol, but at least he has a code. And that code is only threatened, and this isn't a joke, by him trying so very hard to not be like James Bond. But damn it, he just can't help himself. He's just like James Bond. Look at him. Now listen here, 007. This is a Hitachi magic wand. If you really want to infiltrate the trans community, just plug this machine in like so. You can make any girl, dick or no dick. Come on, Graham. It's okay. You can give in. Be James Bond. Graham Finger? Is that a new thing? My dad believed in chivalry. That's what he meant when he told me not to be like James Bond. Like most things, chivalry as a code has sexist roots. But at least it's a code. I think men need a code. I tried to follow dad's warning regarding James Bond, but always is a long time. There were occasions where I was thoughtless and cruel. If it's any consolation to those I hurt, I carry those moments around with me, and they occasionally make me catch my breath with the force of the self-loathing. Men used to be risking their lives running around after mammoths, and now... <laughs> gender, gender critical, everyone. Men used to be risking their lives running around after mammoths, and now even those of us who talk of chivalry sit in our arses in front of our game consoles trying to recapture some kind of thrill of the hunt but women have much of the same amount of work they've always had. Dad felt that disparity keenly, I think more than I did during my marriage, to my shame. Fucking hell. Did you hear that, viewers? That's the sound of a man admitting to their misogyny in the guise of generalizations about gender. Graham, babe, if you really wanted to be a good feminist, you always had the option of doing your share of the work around the house. This isn't a man versus woman thing. This isn't a you being lazy thing. Perhaps if you feel like, biologically, you shouldn't have to do as much housework, you might, I don't know, have a problem with women. Also, I hate to imply you're not physically fit, but come on mate, you wouldn't have been running around hunting mammoths even in prehistoric times. In fact, the whole hunter-gatherer hard dichotomy is a myth, and I know that because this is literally one of my fields of expertise. If you crave the thrill of the hunt so bad, maybe you can get some of that thrill out of your system by cooking or cleaning instead of, as you say, sitting on your ass in front of your game console and letting your wife, sorry, ex-wife, be your domestic servant. I'm sorry, this kind of evolutionary psychology gender essentialist bullshit really gets under my skin. Not only does it have very little backing in science and history, but people always use it to justify their own failings. Graham, it's okay to admit you're a bad husband. It doesn't have anything to do with your ancestral drive to shove a spear through an animal five times your size. This is about you as a person. This is on you. And I'm actually genuinely sorry to have to tell you that. In fact, very little of this whole thing you've gotten yourself involved with has come crashing down on you due to anything but your own failure to recognize your descent into a hateful little cultist. Earlier in the book, Graham, you heavily imply that Mark Fisher, a writer beloved by a huge part of the trans community, killed himself because the trans community canceled him. It's clear in reading this that you wrote it because you see some of your own struggles in him, and in particular his essay, Exiting the Vampire Castle. I hate to have to be the one to tell you this, Graham, but this is just beyond the pale. While I voice my opposition to what I see as a class reductionist approach to social issues in my video on Slavoj Žižek, I respect Fisher's work, even this essay, much more than anything you've written here. In fact, I respect Žižek's work a lot more, but genuinely. Because Žižek and Fisher, especially Fisher, actually has points. He has things to say. What you've written here is nothing like that. It's a manifesto, badly hidden in a memoir. Capitalist realism is a foundational read for me and for many leftists. 
It's a must read. You, on the other hand, have just spewed hate. The reaction to Fisher was nothing like the reaction to you. And the implication here that trans people drove him to suicide is just fucking disgusting. And given some of your biggest allies right now are a literal billionaire, a literal baroness, multiple members of parliament, and people who march with literal Nazis, your credentials on building comradeship and solidarity and returning to class-based analysis are frankly worth less than a stale turd. And upon reading this, I just have to ask, what the fuck? But I got into exactly what the fuck, we'd have a big problem on our hands. You see, in Tough Crowd, How I Made and Lost a Career in Comedy, a memoir by Graham Linehan, Graham makes one of these claims every two sentences, and sometimes every sentence. A full half to two thirds of this book is wall-to-wall -wall screechings about how all trans people are evil predators that thirst for the blood of children. But for me, the weirdest thing about this book is that there's a third of the book that's not that which is just a fairly cheery recollection of making beloved Irish sitcom Father Ted. And the contrast between that fairly cosy memoir and the other side of this book, the one where Glynna's brain melts from incandescent rage to the point where it dribbles out of his mouth and runs down his nose, makes this a really hard book to talk about. Honestly, this book is basically what would happen if you gave the most hateful person you'd ever met 200 pages to write the longest and most unhinged screed in existence, and then stuck that to 100 pages of an old man reliving his last happy memories before his arteries clog up from his blood turning into pure carbonara. And you might think that sounds harsh, but it's not a whole lot harsh than some of the honestly accounted official reviews of the book. Graham Linehan has styled himself as a hate preacher, and even by those standards, it's hard to argue that this is his magnum opus, Considering he gave up everything to become this, the fact that this book was all he could produce out of it is just kind of sad. And as for the horrific things Graham has said about trans people and how that led to this, there are a million words I could say, and I've already said in past videos, but I don't even need to use my own words for this. Even the review of Tough Crowd in The Independent summarizes the nadir of Graham's career in a few brief but devastating paragraphs. This comes from the fucking British press. Graham, you're losing, you're losing the British press. This is, this is a new low even for you. In my view, and that of its critics, some of his online remarks have been plainly and unapologetically transphobic. Linehan has characterized the trans rights movement as pedophilic and called trans activists and allies groomers. It's true enough that his former life is in tatters, the controversies led to the end of his marriage, the abandonment of a planned lucrative Father Ted musical, and his agent dropping him. Often, Linehan paints trans women as predators, men looking to insinuate themselves into women's spaces in order to assault them with greater ease. When convenient, they are made out to be victims, brainwashed and exploited young queer people who are convinced to mutilate their bodies in the name of gender ideology. To an extent, this book's very existence disputes the pretense of Linehan to have been deplatformed. If Linehan had siloed his anti-trans views somewhat, rather than warped them into a life-consuming vocation, his once glittering TV career might well have remained intact to this day. And that's really the prevailing takeaway from this book. Graham Linehan describes in depth, by accident, all the reasons he tanked his own career describing his own radicalization as an unreliable narrator that nonetheless reveals the depths to which his life and his mind has sunk. He didn't have to do this to himself, and yet, at every moment, he is given another chance to escape, to call back the life he once had, a life most of us can only dream of, and he refuses out of stubbornness, unable to admit that he's been wrong even for a moment. This whole transphobic turn of his started when one of his IT crowd episodes was criticised for being transphobic. All of this is ego. One pretty mild piece of criticism, and he made tearing down an entire community his entire life. Rather than just accepting it, or even just disagreeing and moving on. One day, I received an email casually telling me that what's generally regarded as one of the best episodes of the IT crowd, The Speech, 
was going to be removed from all future broadcasts of the show on Channel 4. There was also that subplot of Matt Berry falling in love with a trans woman, which of course is what got it banned. The letter said, It is fair to say that transphobia has grown in public awareness since this episode was made in 2008. Attacks on trans men and women are rising and their place in society is vulnerable and some way from being legitimized. None of this is true. Statistics actually show that men who present as women are one of the safest demographics in the UK. What statistics? What statistics? Graham. Citation fucking needed, Graham. Channel 4 had a new boss, Alex Mahan, who I later discovered had done the equivalent of raising a flag to stupidity and misogyny by putting her pronouns in her Twitter bio, which effectively meant that Stonewall Law was now in place. I assume that since I had written three successful beloved and respected sitcoms for Channel 4, all of which were hugely profitable for them, they might have given some consideration to my opinion, but they ignored the points I made, offered only a publicist to help minimise the damage on my reputation they themselves had decided to inflict. Graham relates the story in the IT Crowd episode that did him in, the speech, actually came from a true story, where a man that he was talking to didn't care that his date was trans. For some reason, he extrapolated this into a story where a man mishears and then physically fights his date in a violent brawl because how could anyone possibly just be okay with dating a trans person? It's comedy gold, you know, because it's so inconceivable. Unlike dating Graham Lenahan, who is obviously a catch, look at him, with all the beauty and grace of a raisin injected with human growth hormone. Surely Graham, a man who looks as if a manhole cover came to life, is the right person to handle this situation in a cool and extremely normal manner, right? There are moments like this throughout the book. Moments where Graham is talking to a colleague, or a friend, or a loved one, and then trying to portray himself as the hero, instead describes one of the most pathetic scenes you can imagine. To the point where I have to wonder if there was not any point where he read this book back and realised, oh my god, am I a terrible person? In a passage about the road to his divorce, he writes an extremely depressing paragraph, which I think is supposed to make him seem like a moral crusader whose fight made it hard to live his life, but instead makes him look like a bad, if not completely neglectful husband whose ego and stubbornness was far more important to him than his family. The family, remember, he used it as justification for continuing this crusade. Helen was also looking for normality. Birthdays came and went, and they weren't fun occasions. They were overshadowed and fraught. On the day I threw a rare birthday party for her, the magazine Vogue published an article by its trans columnist, Paris Lees, attacking me directly. This was the glossiest publication to denounce me to date, so it lay somewhat heavy on my mind throughout the evening. Helen was perfectly within her rights to ask me to cease operations, but I couldn't do so for another reason, which is, and this is something that everyone who's in this fight knows, the gender stasi never forgive. Even if I had been prepared to recant or keep my mouth shut, it wouldn't do any good because my heresy was out there and would never be forgiven. I was fighting for women and children, sure, but also for my reputation and my ability to make a living. Helen didn't understand that I would never be confident of having a job again until the entire gender ideology movement, which has caused so much misery, was burned to ashes. People would sometimes ask, what's your end game? And that was it. I wanted to reveal the havoc gender identity had wrought on society, expose those who had enabled it, and help bring about its end. Graham. It sounds an awful lot like you missed multiple birthdays and more besides because you were screaming at trans people on the internet. I mean, there's no excuse anyway, to be honest. I mean, if you think that's normal, Jesus fucking Christ. Besides the horrific first-person account of spousal neglect, there's also the cultish attitude on display here. The idea that you can never leave. A sunk cost fallacy that keeps cults like the gender critical movement alive. People keep each other radicalised, keep each other active keep the doubts away, by constantly reminding each other that they've gone too deep already. That the world will never let you live down what you've done. It's either win or die, to paraphrase George R. R. Martin. The thing is, though, there are tons of former transphobes that a bunch of trans people are cool with. Hell, there are trans people that used to be transphobes themselves. Sure, not everyone will be cool with you, 
even if you did everything in your power to make up for what you've done. But enough people will that you'll have a life. A better life than one that leads you to divorce, unemployment, and depression, anyway. A better life than the one that produced this wet fart of a book. But the deeper part of Graham Lenahan this reveals is how much he's driven by ego. This is a theme in this book, if entirely by accident. He describes the slow disintegration of his social life thanks to his radicalization as my exile from the dinner party circuit, and imagines that all of the people he'd worked with that he'd made famous would come along to join him in his heroic fights any minute. He misses entirely that he's not the hero in this story. He's a villain, and not even the main villain. More like the one he faced in the first episode, who's cartoonishly evil, but also easy to beat. He's Buggy the Clown before the character grows, basically. Actually, that's an insult to Buggy the Clown. I like Buggy the Clown. <laughs> when friends and family of his begin to sour on him, he takes it as if they're all believing some dreadful false narrative, failing to understand that the common factor in all this is not some giant cult turning everyone against him. It's him, his behaviour, that's putting them off, that's changing into something ugly. And this is all in his own words. The beliefs on the other side were so insane that I thought my friends would quickly realise how crazy it all was and start lending a hand. But the, my celebrity friends, comedians, you know, intellectuals who have every, who have an opinion on everything else under the sun except this subject, they just said to stay silent. And all it needs, all it needs is just a few adults to step into the room and say, hang on a second, he's not saying anything particularly controversial. Why is he so, why is he so toxic? It is sexual abuse of women that has been covered up by the coach, by sporting bodies, and by people like, and I'm gonna give, well, actually, no, I won't say that they're covering it up, but I will say this. People, the people who've kind of come out against me on this subject, people like Billy Bragg, Stuart Lee, Owen Jones, Laurie Penny, you know, the, the list is, is as long as both my arms. Those people are complicit in this rape culture. Because I stood up for these kids, you know? And, and so, and no sense that anyone is realizing they've made a mistake. No, in fact, it's it's only through coming onto shows like this that I have a chance of maybe getting the ear of one of these people and making them realize what they're doing. You know, someone with a smaller ego might eventually, somewhere during this process, start questioning whether it is the world that's broken or whether it's just yourself. Surely, everyone can't all be wrong, but you. Right, Graham? Well, no, and from here on in, he basically turns into that Principal Skinner meme, but unironically. Am I so out of touch? No, it's the children who are wrong. He does play with this theme of ego a little bit, in a joke about leaving a job because it wouldn't let him use the word I, but I feel like if you were self-aware enough to write that, if you had two working brain cells, you might start putting the puzzle pieces together on the rest of your book and the rest of your life. Unfortunately, he does the opposite. Also, this is unrelated, but he talks a bit about Woody Allen, which is also a thing a few other arch terse like Hadley Freeman do a lot. And I have to wonder, is there something about a man who groomed his own stepchild that they all find common cause with? Because I don't think I've known a group of people so aghast at imagined grooming, yet so happy to constantly reference and praise someone who so clearly is the embodiment of that which they claim to hate. Anyway, and perhaps the most revealing passage of the book, in which he describes how the Father Ted musical ended up falling through, he tells a story that's supposed to paint him as some sort of brave hero trying to stand up for what's right. What he instead writes is a story about a man obsessed, unable to think about anything but his burning hatred of trans people for even a second, to the point where he gave up on everything that wasn't directly an attack on trans people. It starts with him confused about how even his closest friends and family think he's doing something wrong, which would usually be the part where we would start to question ourselves, right? But instead of reflecting on why everyone but him thinks he's gone off the deep end, he hand waves their concerns away as a consequence of his fight being too much for them to take on, before opining about not being a millionaire, as if the reason he was getting flack was because he wasn't rich enough, rather than, you know, 
the fact that he's relentlessly attacking trans people. But rather than keeping his head down long enough to get Father Ted the Musical to work out, once his colleague tries to both size the issue to try and get him to stop going on about it, Graham writes a letter to the people he's relying on to get this project off the ground. Remember, he has consistently blamed trans people for destroying this project. However, he outlines how it fell through here. And it's all him. We had nothing to do with it. Instead, he describes in detail how he, personally, ruined any chance of having work outside of his ongoing harassment of minorities. And he doesn't even realise he's doing it somehow. In the letter, he tells those he needs on the side that, far from being on the wrong side of history, he had been proved right time and time again. Again? Citation needed. Just to make sure his colleagues knew this was pointed, he reiterates that both sides are not to blame for the toxicity of the debate around gender, which, in fairness, is true. But not in the way Graham means it, as anyone reading this book would soon conclude. But you wouldn't even need to read the whole book to reach that conclusion, since in the very same sentence, he says that gender ideology is destroying lives, which to those without a dog in this fight would sound at best like gobbledygook, and a worse than something a cartoon villain would say before they plan to bomb in a hospital. But it gets better, because in this same letter, he tries to frame all of this as defending his daughter, that she is not a cervix haver, which I could only assume means she's a trans woman, since she has no cervix, which makes this whole book very confusing. Anyway, trans or not, Graham insists she is a woman, and she is his daughter, and he will not abandon his daughter. Might I remind you, dear viewers, that Graham did precisely that with his anti-trans crusade already. If his family were calling on them to do this for them, they would be with him, encouraging him. Instead, they did the opposite. They tried to get him out because they cared about him. Graham, stop kidding yourself. Own your ego. This isn't about your daughter. This is about you. This is about you being right, pure and simple. You destroyed your family because you couldn't admit you were wrong. You destroyed your reputation and your career because you were so arrogant that the idea that one single episode of TV you wrote might be problematic made you turn your life inside out to destroy every single person that might possibly have watched something you wrote and found it wanting. That has nothing to do with your daughter. Most of us have faced criticism for stuff we've done. Most of us have done bad things. We can move on. We don't destroy everything around it. We don't implode our lives. This has nothing to do with your daughter. And frankly, you need to have your Walter White moment because it's coming sooner or later. For those of you who don't remember the ending of Breaking Bad or never saw it, in the final season, after spending years insisting he was cooking meth and slowly growing a criminal empire purely for his family to leave them with something after he died of cancer, Walter White admits to his wife, in one of his first moments of honesty in a very long time, that he didn't do any of it for his family. It was for him. He did it because he liked it. Because he was good at it. One day, Graham, you will have to have the same reckoning with yourself. You do not fight trans people because you're concerned about your daughter, or your ex-wife, or your friends, or the grateful female strangers you imagine. You do it because it makes you feel important. Because it makes you feel like a revolutionary. Like a brave warrior fighting for injustice against insurmountable odds. When really, you're just another in a long line of bigots. Who shakes in his boots at the idea that a minority group you don't think deserves to live has a voice with which it can use to criticise you. You believe your work should be beyond reproach, but none of us are. None of our work is. Once you accept that, that you can be criticised and move on without it destroying the sanctity of your art. Maybe you can start to accept the real reasons why you were doing all of this. All the things that I did. You need to understand. I have to hear one more time that you did this for the family. I did it for me. I liked it. I was 
was good at it. In the letter to your colleagues, Graham, you wrote, I'm sorry to have to put it in such strong terms, but these people are monsters and everyone needs to start standing up to them. I think you should reread that line and think about what it really means to call a group of people monsters, especially considering the history behind that kind of rhetoric. For all your talk of fascism, trans people were one of the groups the Nazis went after the hardest. And they use exactly that kind of rhetoric to justify it. Try and retrace your steps and think back to when everyone close to you, as you put it, in your own book, thought you'd done something wrong. They were right. And clearly it left an impression because you wrote it down. Only someone who can't see past their own ego, who can't admit for one minute they could ever be mistaken, wouldn't be given pause by everyone they love trying to hold them back, to stop you before you made the mistake you made with this crusade, with the way you neglected your family in favor of this crusade, with the way you destroyed the passion project you insist Father Ted the Musical was. You had so many chances to stop this, Graham. I guarantee if you take a step back for a minute and read your own book, your own accounting of these events, as I did, you'll see, because you lay it out very clearly, that trans people didn't get this musical cancelled. You did. Trans people didn't tear your family apart. You did. Trans people didn't make you a public pariah. It's right there in this book. You did. And after writing that letter, you had the audacity to turn up in front of the people you sent the letter to and ask what you were being accused of, framing it once again as no one ever having been able to tell you why you shouldn't be defending your daughter. And they can't do that because you're not defending your daughter. This has nothing to do with her. It never has. And I'll just leave how you describe how the meeting following the letter went on screen now for everyone. Because I don't think you realize how bad this makes you look. Graham, you are not the hero in this story you're telling. Even in your own version of it, I read your version. God knows how the other perspectives would look. Trans people were not in the room when you ruined your career. Trans people were not in the room with your family as it fell apart. You've described both of those events in this book, and the common denominator in them is not trans people. It's you. You're the problem, Graham. I'm sorry. I'm sure that sucks to realize. But only by hearing that and accepting it can you begin to turn things around. Now, if you want to hear my raw thoughts on this book as a whole, well, dear viewer, the sad truth about this book is that it's simultaneously extremely readable and leaves you feeling disgusted afterwards. Like having a night out drinking a disgusting but cheap beer it goes down your throat, but the more you drink of it, the more you hate yourself and the experience. When I sat down to read this book, it was with the intention of covering it in great detail. But honestly, after reading it, I couldn't bear to face it. For months. This video, the one you're watching right now, has all my thoughts I'll ever be able to put to paper on this book contained within. And then I'm looking forward to never thinking about it again. Because the thing is, as violently dangerous as this book has the potential to be, it, like its author, is practically irrelevant. It has been of a hit piece, thanks to its author's own failings. If Graham Linehan had written this book at the height of his career, with the glory days of Father Ted and the IT crowd firmly his legacy, and his only legacy, this book might have sold like gangbusters. If he'd have come out swinging, with a few hundred pages of spurious claims, bigotry disguised as legitimate concerns, and whinging about being cancelled, back when he was seen as a public figure worthy of respect, he genuinely might have been able to do major damage to the movement for trans rights with this book. As it stands, he's been a Twitter troll for years, known more for his consistent harassment of queer people and women, gay and straight, trans and cis, than for his brief time in the sun as a beloved comedy writer at this point. 
When people hear about Graham Linehan, they picture a hunched over goblin, alone on Christmas Day, so radicalised against trans people that the family he claimed to be doing the fight for left him, furiously posting away rant after rant just for the hope, the diminishing glint of hope, that everything he lost was not for nothing. This man destroyed his life, his career, his family, his self-respect, to become to trans people what people like Anita Bryant once were to gay people. And yet he keeps telling himself that he's still pro-gay rights, even lamenting about having to try to convince his homophobic father to stop being hateful. He keeps telling himself he's doing this for women, despite harassing multiple women off the internet and having consistently made misogynistic and otherwise demeaning comments and content about multiple women. He keeps telling himself he's doing this for his daughter, for his wife, despite them both making it clear in the strongest terms, from what we can tell at least, that they can't be with him as a family while he's doing this to himself. And after that, even after all of that, He's not even the most well-known transphobe anymore. JK Rowling has taken that crown from him. And to be honest, she's much better at that than he ever was. As much as anyone that's read into the issues knows that Rowling is out for blood at this point, there are millions of people who give her the benefit of the doubt, that choose to read the dog whistles as silence, that take her on good faith that she just has legitimate concerns, or just don't read Twitter. For all the horror Rowling is willing to deal to force trans people back into the closet, she has, to this day, remained far more composed, far more intelligent about navigating life as a hate preacher than Graham Linehan, a man who has been denounced even by many in the so-called gender-critical community for going too far. And after all that, after everything, what does Graham have left? He has this book. His last hope at making a big splash while still doubling, tripling, quadrupling down on his burning hatred for trans people. And after that, the book was a flop. Honestly, when I decided I was going to make a video about this book, I fully expected I would be fighting a losing battle. That this book was going to take off like so many transphobic books before it. From the latest Cormoran Strike novel to Irreversible Damage by Abigail Schreier. And I will be one of a few voices, with small platforms but a lot to say, trying to minimise the harm of this inflammatory tone. Instead, no one cares. Not even the people you would expect to. And in a way, that's a sign of what remains of Graham Linehan's legacy. A giant of comedy. His reputation and dignity now but tatters. Tough crowd, for all I worried sold just 390 copies in its first week, failing to reach the top 1,000 best-selling books at launch, 200 places behind a book of knock-knock jokes for kids. And that's even with the serialization, even with the reviews in The Guardian, The Independent, The Spectator and beyond, even with Richard Ayoade, one of the breakout stars of the IT crowd, singing its praises on the cover. And while Ayoade was a panelist on Big Fat Quiz of the Year last Christmas like nothing had happened, Glinna was nowhere to be seen on the silver screen, and he likely won't be unless he makes some drastic changes to his life. Beyond the occasional interview with someone just as hateful as him trying to get him to cry on TV again about how he lost his wife because he was too correct about the trans lobby, that is. It might sound harsh, but the one thing this book release proved beyond a shadow of a doubt is that even among the most extremely online transphobic cultists, Graham Lenahan is yesterday's man a nobody even among the people he destroyed his life for. If he were anyone else, I might feel sorry for him. But he spent years comparing me and mine to Nazis, to concentration camp guards, to torturers, to child molesters, to mass murderers and paedophiles, and calling trans people the gender star theory repeatedly throughout this book, so... Sucks to suck. I'm usually a forgiving person, but... This man has made it his mission to make life hell for my community. He's one of the reasons I felt strong-armed into leaving the country and its toxic media environment behind. Hell, he won't remember this, but he personally harassed both myself and my partner in the past after I was in that one advert one time and was accused of trying to coerce lesbians into sex by sitting in a chair and 
putting makeup on for a day to get the money I needed to finish my PhD. I can all but guarantee, if you ask any trans person online, they'll have a story of how Graham Lanahan personally came after them, tried to ruin their day, tried to imply they were a sex criminal. When usually the worst they might have done is look hot in the profile picture, or even just exist online as a trans person. And if you disagree with this, and even after all Graham Lenahan has done, you still think he deserves more grace than this? Fine. Buy his book. God knows someone needs to. He's gotta get the carbonara money somewhere. And honestly, maybe the two of you should talk. I think that man needs a friend right now. Someone needs to start some of the de-radicalization journey. And I'm sure as hell not gonna be me. I'm done giving transos the benefit of the doubt. After years of being harassed, attacked, denigrated and pushed out of public life, you learn to pick your battles. And if Graham's divorce can't convince him to stop spending his every waking hour attacking trans people, and instead makes him want to cozy up to fascists and compare trans people to the SS, I don't think anything will stop him. At this point, the only person that can save Graham Linehan is Graham himself. So, if you're watching this, Graham, hi. I like the part about Father Ted. That was actually quite a nice read. The rest of this book was sloppy, hateful, and just plain shit. Just know, Graham, that there is still hope for you. I don't even hate you. I used to really admire you, but now... Listen, I read this entire book, and it's less anger-inducing than it is just pity-inducing. I pity you, Graham. You need help. All those friends that don't talk to you anymore, they will take you back. I guarantee it. If you let go of this ridiculous crusade. If you let go of the hate that destroyed your family, your career, your fan base, everything. There is a life for you after that. If you just take a moment, step outside yourself for a second, and listen to how you sound to other people. You'll see what the problem is. Comparing puberty blockers to Nazi eugenics? Comparing trans people are happily just going about their lives to the guards at a concentration camp? You don't hear the hyperbole in there? And if you don't, consider this. Consider this. Consider this. You're 55 years old. Grow the fuck up. Let people live their lives. You've lost this fight. Now learn to live in your defeat. And to my audience, thank you for watching this far. I hope you learn not to read this book, Eldritch Horror that it was. Please avoid staring at its pages for too long, so as not to summon the great old ones to pull you into the abyss within. Graham Linehan is not a man worth paying attention to. But I don't need to tell you that, because no one bought this bloody book. So clearly no one is paying attention to even his mainstream work. Never mind his public unravelling on YouTube and Twitter. For my final word on Graham Linehan, I leave you with this. In 2023, Graham Linehan released his confusing memoir, Tough Crowd. It was surprisingly readable for what was essentially a manifesto, with a little bit of the making of Father Ted thrown there between the sections where Graham pukes up blood and demands you become the Unabomber, but for trans people. As for the man himself, in the end, this book is his legacy. And as his legacy, it's fitting that it has done as poorly as it has. It was released, made a stink in an isolated area, then dissipated, forgotten, like a fart in the wind. Thanks so much. Militarts or something. D I B O R C E, find out what it means to me. D I B O R C E, lose your mind, go away free. Graham calls, women cuts, Graham shouts at the UN. Graham hides a hateful book, just my cup for Dibbles Man. Breasts women every week, gets a visit from police, stand up with no audience. What we ever get release? Yes, what?
Hiya, thank you for watching this video. That was, that was weirdly Australian. Hiya, thank you for watching this video. I'll, I'll stop that now. I've got Australian patrons. Please don't, please don't unsubscribe. <laughs> I like Australia. <laughs> hey, thank you for watching this video all the way to the end. If you like this video, why not like it, leave a comment, subscribe, and tell your friends about it. I am unfortunately quite poor right now, so if you have a few coins burning a hole in your pocket and you hate to see a trend like me down on her luck, why not help get me out of a massive, horrifying, gaping, burning, other big words, overdraft, and send me some money? You can give one-time donations on Coffee or on PayPal, links below. As always, I really appreciate it every time. Or better yet, sign up to my Patreon, where you can get early videos, access to the members-only Discord, my Nintendo Switch friend code, and exclusive content, such as long-form interviews with Princess Weeks, Rosenquits, and Jesse Gender, with more to come. In addition to all that good stuff, you'll also, if you sign up, get your name read out at the end of each video. Just like these lovely people. Oh, and also thank you to Neil for the leftist jokes for worse than this. <laughs> I'm reading this from a different script. Like, it was it was so nice. I'm, re I'm really, really grateful. Um, Neil and Sarah, they both helped me a, a lot in in my YouTube stuff. I mean, I wouldn't know. It, it's hard to describe it. They, they shared some of my videos quite early on and also had me on FD algorithm and they've been very helpful with just advice and just talking to me. So I'm I'm very grateful to Leftist Cooks always. So thank you. Anyway, <laughs> if you sign up to my Patreon, you'll get your name read out at the end of each video, just like these lovely people. Scully, Jan, Lloyd, Luciente, Stephanie, Jason Cribbett, Raven Tempest, Shield Daden, Robin Podolsky, Exploding Turtle, Casual Observer, Terry Roberts, Manta Ray, Courtney Burmack, Sleepy Slug, Philippa Tabroga, Belligerent Kitten, Simmer, Piglet, Brain Douche, 4IS, Artie Wolf, Hayden Gala, Greg Noble, Deanna McMillan, Caroline Regalado, Alexandra Lilly, PJ Lisbrell, Howard Lott, Lara Van Lunera, Nia Scarjan, Joey Cobalt! I love all you guys. You <laughs> genuinely the only reason I can still be doing this. I really appreciate you. And if you have a really fun name to say, um, please sign up because I, I just there's something about reading these names that gives it's a certain rhythm to some of them. You know, I mean, I would click my fingers, but I can't do that anyway. <laughs> Thank you for watching to the end. Goodbye.